Welcome to the Stonehenge View, a podcast series which interviews a range of sport club representatives and leading professional sport club personnel during the COVID-19 shutdown. We find out what these people are doing during the current health crisis with some of our most popular winter sports seasons postponed. I'm Mark Heenan, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Mark Stone. Now, Stoney, we're going to talk something a little bit different today. We're going to talk about the COVID-19 impacts with the world's best tennis players ahead of the upcoming US Open that starts in the next week and also the French Open, which starts at the end of September. And it's been moved, obviously, to accommodate uh, the pandemic. And and, the, and this person's also a lecturer in media and communications in radio at Swinburne University. So uh, an interesting topic and something that we need to exercise today. Yeah, haven't worked at the Australian Open before uh, in recent times. Uh, Mark, I'm looking forward to the next guest and touching base with uh, all things tennis and uh, a little few insights into maybe some tennis tournaments coming up, Mark. Hayman. Absolutely, Stoney. You might even have to chauffeur this guy around. You just never know. He might be VIP in the coming years and you might have to be, he might use you as an A-listed, uh, you know, courtesy driver. So we'll just why, wait why and see what happens on that path. Why not? Well, our next guest today has been teaching broadcast subjects to undergraduate and postgraduate students at Swinburne University for more than a decade. Having started in the media industry at the age of 15, he has worked across a number of different media outlets. He has worked as a general news reader reporter for the Triple M Network and was the voice of M Sport for a number of years and has also worked as a fill-in on-air presenter at SEN 1116. He currently runs BPM Media, which specialises in online sports broadcasting and podcasting with a focus on sports broadcasting in particular tennis commentary and also VFL as in the Victorian Football League in January he covers the Australian summer of tennis for radio and TV including AO Radio and Tennis Australia's world feed for the Australian Open in recent years he's travelled to Paris to provide French Open commentary for an American TV broadcaster and also to Wimbledon to work as a commentary at the live Wimbledon radio feed he has also worked with ABC Television, providing commentary for the VFL, WNBL, and also was a table tennis commentator for the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. We welcome Heen View, sports broadcaster and tennis commentary man, and also Swinburne University lecturer, Peter Mercado. Welcome to the program, Peter. Well, hello, Marks. It's very nice to be talking to you. I feel with that introduction, we've now just run out of time to actually have the conversation but I appreciate the rev up and uh, yes, obviously known uh, you blokes for, for quite some time. Mark Stone, I've known for a long, long time as we've gone through and done our VFL broadcasting along the way. But yeah, it'd be nice to have a chat and nice to actually talk about some sport that's actually happening. Absolutely. And I love the fact that, you know, for our visual listeners or visual audience out there, you've got the headphones on and you're coming across loud and clear. And we, uh, look, I hope that we haven't shown all the cards today, Peter Mercado, because I think there's a lot of good things to talk to you about, particularly in the current climate. And in a lot of ways, we are doing this podcast in the lead up to the US Open, which normally is the last Grand Slam for the year, but in- incidentally is the second Grand Slam with no Wimbledon and the French Open being pushed back to the end of September. So very interesting there. Peter Mercado, can you just tell us about what you've been doing in ISO? We know that you work at Swinburne University as a lecturer and you're in that media comms radio space. What you've been doing during this time and also the fact is that you haven't been doing any tennis commentary because of the pandemic. So how have you spent your time over the last six months since the world sort of shut down a little bit after March? Yeah, well, exactly right. And not not so much tennis, but also the VFL season, which at the time that we're recording this and putting this together, we would have been on the cusp of the final series had everything have gone ahead as it should have. Um, yes, but there's been plenty of work to do at Swinburne. So moving from an on-campus um, sort of way of teaching method of delivery to an online method of delivery has meant that there's been a lot of work by a lot of people to uh, sort of work out that transition and, and put all of that together, not only for first semester when things, uh, when it all started happening around sort of early March, but also second semester as well. And uh, in addition to all the work that I'm doing now, I'm also um, now the head of journalism at Swinburne. So there's been extra duties there, which has meant that, you know, traveling, uh, not traveling and, and not doing tennis. Normally I have eight weeks off in the, in the middle of the year and, and head overseas and do all of that. There's been plenty of work to do here. And uh, yeah, it's a nice change of pace. I guess a lot of people are, are sort of doing a lot of what I call life admin. So whether 
whether it's going around the house and doing all the odd jobs that have needed doing. I'm going to be moving house soon. So there's been a lot of work that's been involved with that. As I've said to people, you shouldn't leave me in the country too long because then I go off and do silly things like buy houses and all of that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's been a nice change of pace. And I figure with all the traveling, which has been roughly 10 years and teaching 15 years and a whole and VFL and everything else, uh, it's been like long service leave. So it's just been a little bit of a, a break. And hopefully though, I think we're now sort of at the stage where we just want things to come back and we just want some assurances that things will be okay and we can get back to some semblance of normal next year. But just with the, the major opens, we know the circus comes to town every January in Melbourne, but the whole thing about uh, how does it look for a commentator moving forward that's uh, been broadcasting tennis as the US Open, French Open, how does it look for you as one of those people that work in that field, in that sort of side of that space? Yeah, well, sadly for this year, I'm not going overseas. Normally I go at the end of the year as well to finish off the ATP season and head over to London, but because of all the uncertainty and obviously the government regulations about being able to get out of the country and needing permits and all of that sort of stuff, it's not viable to do. And it's also, you know, if you are travelling from a long way away, it's certainly not viable if you land in, say, London for the, the end of season championships and just as you arrive, they tap you on the shoulder and let you know that actually, no, because of COVID, it's not happening. Now, it's not the case at the moment, but there's potentially could happen that way. So it's meant that for those who are travelling around, they, they can't get around with as much freedom and can't necessarily broadcast. So it's a bit of a, you know, a year where we just get through this year, but next year, hopefully, there'll be a few more controls in place and we'll have the ability to, to move around a lot more. And certainly for January, all the signs are pointing towards, yes, we'll have an Australian Open. It's just, what does that actually look like? And we won't know that until we get to sort of November, December, and we see how it's actually tracking in Melbourne. But I know that they're like the US Open, and I know we'll talk about this in a moment. They've got the, they're going to set up the travel hubs and bubbles and things like that. So I think the latest information, what they're working on is making sure players can come down about six weeks out, like six weeks before the, the season starts. So if they want to come down and quarantine, practice, train, they can do it in a safe way. So there's a, a body of evidence. The US Open will be a good example just to see what works and what doesn't. And then they'll put all that into practice for January. So yeah, I'm pretty confident we'll have an Australian Open. Peter, with regards to the US Open, and I did a little bit of a dot list in the last few days of the top 10. And in the top 10, you know, you've got Novak Djokovic, who's number one, and there was a yes to the US Open. And there was a couple of probables, there was no. So from Novak Djokovic to David Goffin, which was a possible, and there was no's and probables in between. If we look at the women's, obviously Ash Barty said no, she's not going to the US Open, as, as well as Simona Halep. And then the only yes in the top 10 that I have here was Serena Williams. Everyone else was a no or a probable. My question is, is that with regards to the US Open, how can we sort of understand the importance of a top 10 player not putting their health risk? So if you're a player outside the top 50, we understand it's harder for them to make a buck. So they're probably more forced to play because they've got to earn a living. Whereas these top 10 players have probably endorsements and sponsorships and those sorts of things. And they've got a bit more control on their finances. So does that surprise you with the level of um, no's and probables as opposed to the yeses? And will, will you see more players outside the top 50 having a chance to win the US Open with those players that have pulled out? Well, potentially. I think there's still a, a good number of players in both draws, um, top 10 notwithstanding. Um, and, and big names notwithstanding that are still going to be there to make it a proper tournament. But look, it's an individual choice. And the thing I've always said, and doesn't matter whether it's going into COVID hubs, playing the US Open, bad behavior, whatever, the players aren't representing anyone else other than themselves. So they need to make their own personal choice as to whether they're going to travel and and participate and go through all the protocols. So the official protocols, and you can look them up on the US Open website of what they're actually doing, is seven pages long. And uh, the tournament's split into three tiers and they've done all of the work and the hard work in terms of getting it together. If a player doesn't want to take that risk, both traveling internationally and then while they're there, or doesn't want to be restricted in terms of when they are there, where they stay, how many people they can have in their entourage, that sort of thing, which is in place now then they won't play. I think another aspect to it is the fact that as soon as the US Open's finished, everyone flies across to Europe and just, we've got the, the French Open, which will be a quick turnaround pretty much straight after the US Open. So they've got to consider their preparation and whether it's actually worth going over there and playing. But in this crazy year, you can't uh, begrudge players for making the decision that, that's best for them. Yeah, obviously, you know, top 50, even top 100 players um, struggling to make a living out of the sport will want to turn up and do 
do everything they can. And I know a player like the Aussie player, John Millman, who's, um, you know, been inside the world's top 50. He's got some really good results. Um, the momentum obviously dropped off because he was obviously not playing this season so far. And he went the long way around. So Brisbane, I think he went to Doha and then from Doha flew to New York because of the lack of direct flights going into the US. So they've had to make some enormous sacrifices, the players who are there, and we should be celebrating that. Is there a potential for a player outside the big names to, to win one? I think certainly. Yeah, absolutely there is. And there's so many other factors. So they're not playing with any crowds. So how do players react at, at big moments? And we're seeing it yeah, this week. The Cincinnati Masters has moved to New York and they're playing it now. How do you react when you haven't got a crowd there to feed off? Um, that's one thing. Another thing is how, how much tennis the players have actually played. And for a lot of them, they haven't played any at all or very little. So, you know, how do they come in when their first match potentially is the first round of the US Open? That could be another factor, deciding factor in there. There's so many different variables here. We won't know until we get to the end of the first week who's in who's in the best shape because it's just such a unique season Pete just I'm um, curious um, are they commentating that off the TV or are they actually at the event that's one question and you um, Mark was saying before about table tennis internationally what is it so unique about a Grand Slam event that you come to Melbourne or you go to US or you go to French and, and commentate you know what you class as your sport because that's what you played and that's what you're good at is it you know what's so unique about a Grand Slam event when you're commentating the game well, I'd like to say I was good I tell people I was good once, Tony. <laughs> it was a long time ago and I can't remember. Uh, but, yeah, look, it's a, and each Grand Slam has a different feel. So to answer your first question, there will be some broadcasters on site, but they will be largely, I think, for the most part, the vast majority will be American broadcasters because they're already in the country or they're already in New York, so it's not a huge issue um, to have them there. Internationally, it's a little bit harder to get in and out. There may be some there. The world's media, so those who are covering for newspapers or online publications, that sort of thing, they're not going to be on site at all. So there's a, a reduction in the media presence that's there, but they're doing a good job in terms of media conferences and stuff like that are being streamed on um, platforms like the one that we're chatting on, on Zoom um, and various other ones too. So they can be keeping in touch and, and quotes and asking questions and stuff like that. But the special thing about the Grand Slam is it's a chance to get everyone together. I mean, the, the, they're the biggest four tournaments that we have during the year. So it's a real opportunity for everyone to, to come together, to meet, to celebrate all of that sort of stuff and each of the four has their own particularly unique flavor so because they're so big you get the most people the general sort of smaller tournaments that are held throughout the year and yeah it, it's just that that opportunity it's the pinnacle of the sport it's uh it, the different vibes depending on which city you go to and it's just a, an all-round good experience and i've been very lucky over the past 10 years to be able to experience at least three out of the four they take me into swinburne in a lot of ways because you know outside of my media you know I, I'm really passionate about teaching and education in young people and it's a career that I've also followed as well but you're in a, you're in a different phase with obviously uh, postgraduate um, and you know obviously students that are going on to, to, to work in media and comms now a little bit about Swinburne um, you know when I was a lot younger is that I was fascinated by the radio school there that Jim Barber was uh, you know a key note in running I mean what sort of legacy has he left particularly with Swinburne and what? Um, how, how are you coping with interacting with students at the moment because of the COVID situation and what things have you, have you had to do differently? I mean, you're not probably going on site like you used to, but... Well, I'd like, as I say, I'd love to take you inside Swinburne, but the campus is shut at the moment and there's all these different protocols to get on there in the first place. But in a metaphorical sense, um, yeah. So to unpack a, a couple of bits and pieces with that. So the legacy that Jim left in terms of the work that he did there, we still have radio as a strong part of our program and not just radio now but with the the work that we're, you're doing right now in terms of podcasting and vodcasting uh, is flavor of the month again which is fantastic to bring audio back into fashion because it sort of lost a little bit of it along the way so it's about balancing the competing interests there and certainly that legacy is there we've still got great studio facilities as well um, we've had a, a refit of the studios um, along the way but we actually named uh, the main studio complex after him because of all the work that he did there but yeah sadly that course is no longer it finished in 2012 but yeah we still have it at undergraduate and still have representation at postgraduate level too in terms of what we're how we're delivering and how we're communicating with students it's been a huge thing i had never heard of the word zoom other than <laughs> what you do with a camera um, at the start of the year now i'm on zoom teams skype <laughs> 
blue jean, you know, you name it, I've got the platforms down. <laughs> it's sort of, it's different because it's just very impersonal. So you don't necessarily have the, the group interaction as you normally would, but it does work in terms of one-to-one interaction. And it's a bit of trial and error in terms of how you actually reach out to the students. It took a little while to, to get used to, but now I think we're in the mode of, of understanding how this works. The, more importantly, the students understand how it works. And we a lot of them are doing it really tough at the moment in terms of, you know, that the, they've got no work, other work that they're doing and stuff. So that some of them want to invest time in, in their studies to take their mind off the other things that are going on. But it's a really difficult scenario, but we're battling through as best we can. And just before Stoney asked his next question, I was... Um like us, uh, when I got into uh, post school, I you know ended up doing the, the broadcast journalism course at Holmes Glen, and um, you know it was one of the best life decisions I ever made. Um, and it wasn't always about uh, your grades or anything like that. It was about the passion to actually deliver the product, understand about the media, and it's just really interesting the evolution of someone that has left school now that goes on and studies uh, a you know a media course. Uh, how they how they feel motivated because of the current climate, and particularly even with newspapers now doing a lot of cutbacks and, and notice that there's been significant changes at other media outlets as well. Yeah, I think though that there's, uh, there's a couple of things to unpack with that. What we're experiencing with our students is what's happening in industry anyway. So, you know, take this podcast, for example, if in an ideal world, if we didn't have COVID or anything and you'd still set it up, we may have been meeting in a cafe somewhere and recording it live and just going backwards and forwards with a microphone, not doing it this particular way. So, you know, our methodology, a way of doing things is different in journalism they're still going out they're still having to do interviews and while they can't do them face to face we now have the technology to get around that the students are, are in the same boat and they're still learning those particular skills but the other thing to remember too as i'm sure you would have found uh, mark is the whole idea of how you transfer the skills that you have and adapt them to other industries so journalism can't be just that traditional sense and we had a lot of prospective students and parents coming up and going oh newspapers are dead why would i bother doing journalism journalism. Well, as we know, working in the online space, there, there are so many opportunities out there for journalists and in particular storytellers. It's not just the straight journalism or hard news or things like that, but there are new publications opening up all the time. There's opportunities in the corporate world, there's opportunities in the PR world, and they're looking for storytellers, people who can use technology for a start, which is important, but also be able to deliver those stories and deliver them in a quality way and kind of be a one-stop shop. And then there's also the freelancers on top of that too so they can't be just sort of narrow-minded in terms of oh these traditional spaces are, are dying or we're losing jobs that yeah we absolutely are but there's still enough work around and the skills you learn the skill set needs to be the focus i'm a good storyteller Pete, as you know well, i know you are stony <laughs> hey, my listen, word you are <laughs> i want to take you back to plenty fm and oh. way back then right is it why journalism why media why radio why broadcasting what was it about it that was attractive to you and what made you get into it yeah well well, Plenty Valley FM. I should correct you on that study. The right. mighty Plenty Valley FM, August 1997. So clocking up, what is it, 23, 24 years uh, now since I started there. And as I've been unpacking boxes and repacking and everything like that, I think I've still got my original cassette tape of my very first broadcast, which will never see the light of day. I'll tell you that much right now. But yeah, I, that was, it was just a fascination with radio, I think was the main thing. And just sort of listening to, um, you know, FM radio at the time and also AM radio and, and just an opportunity to thought, well, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I had that really clear sense of wanting to get into it. And uh, me and a good friend of mine signed up to do the training course um, at, at Plenty Valley back then, which was six weeks, six Wednesday nights. And so I went through, did that. Then you did your studio training and then you got your own shows and all of that sort of stuff from there. And it was just a good chance to explore, you know, the industry, explore the, everyone I think has a creative outlet and they use it in different ways and mine was sort of based around the media side but really my path was always going to be when I started was traveling to regional areas and and going and and, and being on FM radio and then eventually AM radio and traveling around the place and trying to get back to the capital city didn't quite work out that way but I think the dream is going to be at the end of their career is retire to a beautiful country town and do a nice little two-hour shift on a, a radio station there you know having the opportunity at Plenty Valley to expand not only uh, in terms of what I was doing on air and building the skills on air and I listened to some of that stuff and I think boy that was interesting Why 
why did I do that? But also the chance to get involved in management, to get involved with a whole group of people who are volunteers and learning how to deal with people who have different skill sets, different age ranges, different multicultural backgrounds. It was really, you know, a great learning experience being on committees, being presidents, secretary, treasurer, all that sort of stuff. You did all of them getting involved in programming and yeah, you just pick up that ability. I think with radio in particular, you know, the, the ones who are hardcore radio people have that sort of sense of, of how radio works and it was really great to be in that community. And you mentioned, uh, Mark, in the, the uh, Swinburne course, well, I actually did that course back in 2005 and it was fantastic. It was a really great opportunity which led to being involved in news and sport and other areas too. So to answer your question, I, I can't put my finger on exactly where I said I really want to be on the radio, but yeah, it was something that I had early on and it certainly when I started to where I am now, I wouldn't have imagined that I'd be, be doing that, obviously talking to fine gentlemen like you. I mean, that was always part of the life plan, but uh, <laughs> you know, traveling the world and doing all that sort of stuff, it's a completely different path to what I expected. Another thing that Plenty Valley gave me, the ability to learn the technical side of everything too. So when we go out to ground, setting all of that up and being involved in that and set up rosters and commentating and all that sort of thing, you know, you learn a whole range of different skills. And yeah, I, I think, uh, Stoney, I'm sure you do a lot of the legwork too. It's all good, Mike. He does. And it is a bit of bantering, like I said. You know, like I said, Stoney and I, I like to have a bit of banter in there, you know, talk about things about people's lives and, and love the, the, the curly sort of fluffy part of Stoney. He's a very, he's a very engaging character character and you know one thing I like about Mark Stone and I don't want it to be all about him but in a lot of ways he's very he's a great networker and he's a good people's man and that's something that we wanted to start off with um so he does a lot of good stuff and love his editing and it's really coming along as well so I wanted to ask you just before we go is tell me about some of the on-court interviews that you have with some of these tennis players because I noticed you did one with Naomi Osaka the Brisbane International this year and it was on your Twitter page so just talk to me about that as she became obviously an adopted Australian and um there was the bushfire season going on at that time as well so um, just take me into that world as in with the on-court interviews once yeah, well, done and can you talk about that yeah it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting setup the the on-court interview it's something that you never know how the player is going to react when you walk out there there's no pre-planning or anything they've just come off the match they know what the, to do most of them are really well versed in okay yep come here they turn around they actually look for you and and you're standing out there on the court you're ready they walk over to you wait for your cue and off you go um, Naomi's an interesting character because sometimes she'll give you lots of stuff like she did in that interview and it worked particularly well. And other times if she's not feeling like giving much, um, she won't give anything and it becomes a much harder interview. It's, a, it's very entertaining for the audience, but it is hard to generate questions. But you know, one of the things is you obviously need to have watched the match to have understood what was going on. You, you plan as much as you can in advance talking about some of the questions. They're now looking for more left of center questions. So not just hardcore analysis on what happened in point three of set number two sort of stuff. Stuff. They want a bit more broader interest stuff. And the players are pretty good. You give them one question, then the good ones will just go forever. Save you having to ask a hell of a lot of questions. They know. You just say, oh, hello, how are you? And they'll give you an analysis of the match straight up. They're really good at that. Some of the younger ones who are coming through, it takes a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, they can be quite fun. I'm no uh, Jim Courier or John McEnroe or anything like that in terms of the interviewing. You go out there, ask a couple of questions, get the crowd involved and then move on. But yeah, it's just a part of the job, really and getting to do that a bit more in Australia and just pinch hitting for, for the others who, who come in and, and do that as their regular gig along the way. So a little bit of fun along the way, something a little bit different. Tony, any departing words for uh, Mr. Peter Mercado of BPM Media as well? So make sure we get that plug in. And of course, the Swinburne Centre, that's the Swinburne Centre we're talking about there, Pete. <laughs> is it, uh, no, he's a great great person to be alongside. I've enjoyed the VFL and uh, let's hope we get a season up and going next year. But thanks for your time, Pete. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hopefully with all the changes that are going on, that's a another half hour podcast all on its own but yep thank you boys have enjoyed the chat well Peter Mercado you can also uh, rate uh, Mark Stone's editing skills as well so um, I've been very pleasantly surprised how much of an improvement is so you give the guy a bit more work he'll put the effort in and he'll do a good job so thanks for being a good sounding board for Mr Mark Stone as well on the technical side happy to help and I'll just lock in a 10 right now it'll be 10 out of 10 study let's just put it in right now well your voice is coming through loud and clear we love the radio professionalism as well because that's been a really key note of your career is in radio and, and all the success you've had in there. Mark Stone, what a great guest. Uh, Peter Mercado has joined us on the Stoneheen View for episode 21. So we're nearly up to two dozen now, but uh, Pete's uh, gave us a great insight into the broadcasting world um, as a lecturer, but also into the tennis world as a broadcaster. Yeah, the Swinburne Centre's where's it at? And uh, I'm sure it's all part of 
blame you later. But uh, been a great guest, and uh, bring on the next uh, next episode of the Stonehenge View. Hina. Well, you can get in contact with the Stonehenge View. You can check us out on Facebook and Instagram. We're also on our launching platform, which is Podbean, Apple Podcast, Spotify, and we've also got our YouTube channel up and running. And you can check out our great work, particularly on a weekly uh, event, which you know we generally come out on a Thursday uh, night with our audio platform, and then obviously on a Saturday with our video as well. And um, you know, how many episodes have we got up on the YouTube channel now, Stony? About twenty. This will be twenty-one. Twenty-one episodes on YouTube. So check it out, Stonehenge View YouTube, and uh, for all our uh, past guests. And- interviews and also mark heenan media and media advisory services are bringing this program as well so you can check out the feed on there we've got some information on this program so until next time we'll be back with episode 22 we've got an interesting guest next week someone that is a bit of a pioneer when it comes to the women's football world so we look forward to that guest and that person next week on the stonehenge view for episode 22 bye for now thanks so much for joining us today